and kind of interactive as much as possible. So don't be shy to um, try to participate and unmute your microphones when, when um, I, I ask a question or ask you to kind of get involved. All right, so I'll be talking about material science and discovery powered by uh, machine learning. And um, let's see, oh, that's not what I want to do. Hang on, I'm having some clinical difficulties here. How do I get my laser pointer? There you go. All right, so the outline for this talk is first of all, beginning with the motivation. I'll sort of talk about uh, why we want to do this kind of work, why it's interesting, and um, give, give some motivation for, for that. In particular, the motivation will be around in, surrounding material discovery, finding new materials, and why we care about material discovery. It's also something that I will um, bring up. And then we, we would introduce uh, the kind of main tool to, to tackling this challenge, which is um, machine learning. Then have a kind of a case study, which is applying these machine learning tools to discover a new family or new set of materials that are magnetic and two dimensional. Okay. And towards the end, we'll actually have an exercise where you can participate and do this work um, by yourself at home. And what I'll probably do is stop halfway and give kind of like a, a short break. And also give you give, give you a chance to set up um, with these with these tools. All right. So, but let's let's jump in for now. And so, what is machine learning? Depending on who you ask, you might get a different answer. So, my definition is is kind of like this: machine learning is a subset of artificial intelligence. Uh, AI is including machine learning and also kind of robotics. That also is encompassing the term AI. It intersects with data science which is a combination of statistics, data visualization, um, databases, and uh, data mining. Um, you're probably familiar with data science and machine learning to a fair degree. I want to say probably 2010 or so, it became very, very popular from places like Facebook and Netflix with their movie recommendations, and probably 2015 or so with uh, self-driving cars, and for a while now, facial recognition, and maybe for some years, um, the spine filters from from emails. I think that's been around for for quite a while. And uh, yeah, of course, this is only the past twenty years or so, right? And it turns out, data science has been around for much longer than that. Actually, if you go back to about six hundred BC, we would find uh, Thales of of Miletus in ancient Greece it is the first uh, reported or known record of a data science that, that data scientists that, that exists. So the story of Thales is the following. He was a Greek philosopher and Greek philosophers didn't, don't, didn't often make a lot of money, but Thales was um, particularly clever. And what he did was he studied the weather and he determined that in a half a year from the time he was in, uh, there was gonna be a really strong uh, crop of, of olives. So he, he bought up all the olive presses in the, the city of, of, of Militas. And the following year, there was a, a big um, olive output and everyone had to go for him to get access to the olive presses. So he made quite a bit of money by, um, by doing this, by applying the data of the weather and actioning that data to make a prediction. He should buy the olive presses. He had a good outcome increase in his uh, bank account. So that's an interesting story of the first and known data scientist. Of course, since then, and since ancient Greek, uh, Greece, there have been quite a few more instances of data science in, in the world, uh, you know, in application to social media, suggesting friends, for instance, uh, targeted advertising. Um, if you search for uh, shoes on Facebook, you might see some uh, ads for, for um, different brands of shoes pop up. Uh, more recently, for the science applications in bioinformatics, folks doing bioinformatics have been doing machine learning for some time, uh, much uh, more time than folks in material science, which is a relatively recent phenomenon. And why is that? Uh, because right now, we're kind of in the age of big data. Maybe five, ten years uh, ago, we entered this age where data are readily accessible. And also, the tools for doing data science or data analytics are, are also readily accessible. And so nowadays for, for science, you know, thinking about astronomy, uh, again, bioinformatics, more recently materials physics, quantum physics, 
mathematical physics, I would say maybe in the next past five, 10 years or so, um, geophysics and machine learning applications have really blossomed or exploded in popularity. It's um, really been quite, quite something. I want to say 2015, I would go to the March meeting and there would be uh, one or two mediocre talks on machine learning and material science. 2016, there were one or two sessions that are pretty reasonable. 2017, they were basically uh, bouncers, literally bouncers outside the um, meeting rooms, keeping people from going inside because it was so popular. So this really has exploded in popularity. Um, okay, so if you're new to data science, then this is really the talk for you. Uh, and this particular slide is essentially something you should pay attention to, where I present the essential guide to doing data science. That's very accessible. So this is a picture of uh, some homes in Copenhagen. Uh, and uh, you notice that the homes have um, different colors, different sizes. This one is next to the canal. So it's actually very pretty to take a boat um, around this part of the city. And let's say you're, you're doing real estate in Copenhagen and you're interested in predicting the price of, of homes without having to um, go and talk to the, the owner. Um, you might want to, for instance, get some data about the uh, number of windows or the color of the house or location next to a canal or not, and predict some idea of how much it's going to cost for your, um, for your customers. And these days, you can actually get data about housing prices in, in homes in Copenhagen from Kaggle. If you haven't uh, seen Kaggle before, please just Google Kaggle and take a look. It's a very interesting source of, of data. And then you might ask yourself the question, for this problem, how do I predict housing prices? Uh, you need a model, of course, but uh, before you need a model, you need a way of describing the homes or the house prices you're trying to predict. So you, you ask yourself, what is a good descriptor? And a descriptor is a mathematical representation of the data. And for that, you can construct some descriptor that is describing some mathematical way of uh, describing your house, or you can rely on some domain knowledge. You might talk to your real estate agent friend and say, well, I want to guess house prices uh, how do I do this? And they may say, well, the um, uh, square footage or the area of the home is a good metric for predicting the price, along with maybe its location. So you might think about the zip code being um, a metric for doing that as well. Okay, so that's that's key. Uh, basically taking um, time to think about how to describe your data. This is the descriptor. And then some way to get some uh, idea of how the data are working together or related to each other is to visualize data. That's the first step for building any models. Then you, you pick the appropriate model to make the prediction given your data. So is the model going to be a linear model? Will it be a nonlinear model? Do I want to use a linear regression or neural networks, which is the most appropriate model for my, my task? And then after you make the model, you, you train it, and then you make a prediction, and then you check to test the result. Then once you have a nice working model, you can use it to do something like predict all housing prices um, all over the world and um, not having to look it up or ask someone what the price of the house is. So this is the first example. Are there any questions so far? Okay, so what we'll do we'll, towards the end of the discussion is apply this machinery to study magnetic 2D materials. And this is interesting because in 2017, the first intrinsically ferromagnetic materials were discovered for the first time, relatively recently. Mind you, other materials that are two-dimensional, like graphene, were discovered uh, many years ago. Let's see, many years ago means um, 2005, 2006, or, or thereabouts. Um, and it took quite a, quite a while from discovery of graphene to find these intrinsically ferromagnetic 2D materials. Uh, this graph over here on the left shows a chromium germanium telluride, a part of the crystal structure here, and chromium triiodide shown over here on the right. These plots down here shows a microscope image of chromium germanium telluride alongside MOC images or curved tracing spectroscopy images showing that down to two layers of chromium germanium telluride is ferromagnetic. And, and below the crude temperature, which is below 40 Kelvin, as shown here. And over here on the bottom right is again a MOC or Kerr rotation spectroscopy plot, this time with the hysteresis of the, of the measurement. 
as a function of magnetic field. Okay, showing that down to one layer of chromium germanium of, of chromium triiodide now is um, magnetic. It so happened that I was doing experiments on this material as a postdoc at Harvard back in 2015 or so, trying to isolate one layer of these materials for the first time um, to make a really nice paper. Of course, as you can guess, and since my name isn't anywhere here, I didn't quite make it. And because I had two challenges that I couldn't overcome at the time. The two challenges were uh, the material I was measuring, chromium germanium telluride, using ferromagnetic resonance, I was a little bit air sensitive. So I wanted a material that was less air sensitive than chromium germanium telluride, making it a bit easier to work with. Um, but I, the only other one I knew of at the time was chromium triiodide, which is even more air, air sensitive than chromium germanium telluride. So that wasn't such a good option. I also wanted one that was having different magnetic properties of chromium germanium telluride because the resonance of CGT was a bit outside the range of my equipment to measure. So I needed to find a new material that was two dimensional and magnetic with different properties and chemically stable or not air sensitive. This was quite a challenge. So my career doing computational research and using uh, computational results or first principle simulations with AI kind of blossomed out of this problem. Okay. And it was a challenging problem, and the need to use AI is kind of illustrated in the next few slides. So why is it challenging to find new materials that are of interest with desirable properties? Well, the first is that the material service page is huge. If you take the ICSD or Integrated Crystal Structure Database, for instance, there are over 200,000 entries. Another uh, chemical abstract service database has over 49 million organic and inorganic entries. And if you take some estimates of the virtual chemical space, this is the total number of possible molecules, crystal structures in the universe, you get about 10 to the 100, which is really a huge number. Give you an idea, 10 to the 100 is the estimate for the number of particles in the observable universe. So it's really a large, large number. And it's pretty much impossible to search through this large number of particles or of, of crystal structures and molecules using uh, first principles calculations even worse doing serial experiments. To illustrate this idea even further, let's borrow some slides from our friends at IBM Research. This is a graph showing how technology advanced with advances in materials for magnetic random access memory. Back in the 70s, the technology for um, these MRAM was developed at cryogenic temperatures, 1974. It took about 20 years later, was it only possible to make it at room temperature? And the idea for this MRAM is that if you have two magnetic domains with spins or magnetic uh, directions aligned, you can encode it as a one. And if it's anti-aligned, it's a zero. So you can code information using this MRAM technology with these spins either aligned or anti-aligned. Um, some years later, this, uh, this interleaving barrier here was made more uh, higher resistance, which uh, improved the performance of the, uh, the right speed. And then later on, the read speed for flipping the spins from in plane to out of plane. So the idea is it took more than 30 years to go from the inception of the idea, something that's scalable and efficient that can be used for some industrial application. And we'd really like to have this, this um, you know, materials technology development happen much faster than 30 years, maybe 30 months or 30 weeks or that. And again, the key point is that the advances in the materials really drove the technological capabilities. So if you can find the right materials faster, faster than 30 years in this case, we can make this uh, really nice MRAM technology, uh, energy efficient and, and fast in a very short amount of time. So the idea is to use perhaps 2D materials with intrinsic magnetism to perform this task and perhaps other tasks and identifying the right materials is going to be a, a challenge here, okay? So take, for instance, graphene and MOS2, chromium germanium telluride, chromium triiodide, and boron nitride. Can you tell by examining the crystal structure and the chemical composition what the properties are? Can you tell that graphene, for instance, is conducting, the Dirac cone and boron nitride is insulating, or chromium germanium telluride and chromium triiodide are magnetic? just by inspecting the crystal structure and or the chemical composition, okay? And really there, there's a whole zoo of these 2D materials 
ways you can arrange the atoms on the lattice and different ways you can arrange the crystal structure or rather have different crystal structures. And this is kind of like a, a material space where the, the stars in the outer space is each potential candidate, either a molecule or crystal structure. And exploring this space is like a, you know, of chemical space is like exploring outer space, searching for uh, new worlds uh, that are potentially uh, habitable of particular interest, uh, or maybe for mining, whatever you like. Um, exploring the space is akin to forming, uh, exploring chemical space. It's huge, vast, and challenging to, um, to explore. Okay. Any questions so far? Okay. All right, so let's talk about uh, how we potentially can explore this vast chemical space using machine learning. And for this, let's a little bit dive into machine learning and how um, how that works. So in machine learning, you need uh, data, descriptors, and statistical models. And for the data, there are really a, a huge increase in uh, databases for materials that, that exist nowadays that are easily accessible online. Uh, which is um, one of the reasons that uh, this ML for materials is really uh, booming. Um, there's also these chemical space descriptors that exist. And so these are ways to mathematically describe your materials, your materials data. And there's a whole host of uh, other descriptors that exist besides the earlier ones, Coolidge kernel and the vagabond representation. Um, but people were spending their careers designing descriptors for for describing materials, which is good for people who want to exploit that information. And also data science tools exist, like Scikit-Learn and Google TensorFlow, where again, people are spending their careers building very nice, fast, efficient tools that um, materials physicists like us or, or, or you can you know, can work on um, without having to build the uh, tools or write the code or the software to do that you know, yourself. So that's, that's really nice. So let's talk about each one of these things in a little bit more detail. So first, let's look at data, and everyone knows data exists on the cloud. No stickers, that's supposed to be a joke. So there's Materials Product, which is a pretty popular database these days. This is from the, uh, generated from Materials Genome, and it's comprised mostly of density functional theory data, or these first principles quantum simulations. AFLOW is similar to the Materials Product, led by another group. There's Matnavi, which is uh, based at NIMS, National Institute of Material Science in Tsukuba, Japan. So it happened that I worked at NIMS for a few months when I lived in Japan. And there's C2DB, which is, a, again, a theoretical database for two-dimensional materials. Then we have OQMD, Open Quantum Materials Database, which is, again, theoretical. And there's NOMAD, it's a repository of uh, 2D, rather, of um, DFT calculations, and ICSD, which you've seen before which is this database of crystal structures from uh, X-ray um, diffraction experiments. Okay, so we have data, and then we also have our descriptors. These are, again, mathematical representations of our data. And these can be as simple as a collection of atomic properties of the, or of the constituent elements, or some more sophisticated constructed uh, representation of the crystal structure. And uh, again, um, the next step is a statistical model. You want to have some way of uh, connecting the descriptors to the representation or, or the property you want to predict. And uh, statistical models are things you're familiar with. So this one here is uh, none other than linear regression. So if you've done linear regression before, and I think all of you have, you've already done machine learning, so congratulations. You're already a data scientist, if you didn't realize it or not. Now, but of course, there, there are also more sophisticated models. One here, which is slightly more sophisticated, is this one based on decision trees. How does this work? Let's walk through this really simple and silly example of trying to predict whether or not to give somebody a credit card. So in this case, we have three descriptors, the age, student status, credit card score, and you traverse these nodes in the tree to get to the end where you classify yes or no. So for instance, you can start with a person, ask their age. If they're young, you ask their student status. If they're not a student, you do not give them a credit card. If they are, then you do give them a credit card. Okay, so this is some way of doing this classification. Again, it's just a silly example. 
We could also tune this for doing regression. And we'll see an example for that a few slides from now. But one of the great things, again, for a physicist to want to get involved in this is that there's a very nice data science ecosystem that exists where you can store data using MySQL, you can transform your data with Python, you can model your data with scikit-learn, for instance, and then visualize your nice results using lab.lib. And all of these are optimized, they're efficient, they're fast, and they're free. So it's really a wonderful time to be a materials physicist or a physicist doing work in uh, machine learning. Any questions so far? Okay, so let's keep going. So what is um, uh, data science uh, in terms of uh, machine learning? Uh, why is it important to relate to materials physics? So data science is, as you saw before, a combination of data visualization and machine learning. And it's relevant for materials physics because you can use a machine learning model to approximate some function f of x, which maps uh, things that are easily attainable, for instance, the atomic uh, elements and their chemical properties, something that's hard to calculate or hard to, hard to, to measure, such as you know, the magnetic moment or magnetization of the material. A machine learning model approximates this function and maps these uh, things that you kind of know, something that's hard to, to calculate or hard to measure. Okay. Notice I have here x1 through xn, where uh, if there are just two values, two entries, two inputs, two descriptors, you'd have a two-dimensional space of descriptors. And here you have an n-dimensional space of descriptors. So that number of dimensions is just the number of descriptors in, in the model. And the nice thing about using machine learning for doing this is that this function f of x, you can evaluate very quickly. Whereas the experiment takes some time and the, the simulation also takes some time, but the function evaluation happens very fast. So, so the idea is you can make prediction of a property of a material very quickly just by evaluating this function. Okay, of course, the challenge is to get the right function. Another nice thing is that notice there's x1 through xn where xn uh, n can grow very large. And the idea behind that is machines can extract patterns in high dimensional space, but our human brains can't. Um, but so let's take this example. We have a, just a dot here, which represents a zero dimensional space. And we can see, for instance, the brightness of this dot change. And so we can understand a pattern very easily in this zero D, zero D space. Same for 1D. We can extract some meaning from a, a 1D space fairly easily along with 2D. Um, 2D is very easy because you're looking at the screen right now. You can understand clearly what's what's going on. In the 3D space, you can look around the room and see very clearly what's what's happening, and it's it's no problem for our brains to interpret the patterns that we we're um, we're um, um, filtering through through our brains. Now, in a, in a, a fourth dimensional hypercube, things get more challenging, where um, it's even tough to figure out what's going on with this hypercube. But imagine uh, if you're to peer into a fourth dimensional space. I'm trying to understand what's going on. It's, it's going to be a bit more challenging for human brains to, to interpret that. But for a computer, it's not much of a, a challenge. It's um, it's actually fairly easy to find patterns in high dimensional space greater than four and um, exploit those patterns for quantitative predictions. So that's another key advantage for using machine learning for this kind of material discovery, material prediction task. Okay, any questions so far? Okay, so let's keep going. All right, so we'll deep dive a bit more into the machine learning parts of, of things to get you more familiar with that in case um, it's uh, quite new uh, to you. So in this case, uh, we'll talk about you know why we want to estimate f, why we want to use a machine learning model to estimate this function f of x. Okay, and this particular it, slide is for um, sake of uh, prediction. So our function, f of x, it estimates some target property y, something you want to um, predict. And this hat represents the, um, the estimate, OK? Not the actual, actual value, but just the, the estimate. Typically, you want to do this because you, you have, um, again, you have uh, easily these x values. For instance, the chemical properties in the periodic table. 
And the y values are hard to get at, for instance, the um, whether a material is, is metallic or not, or shiny or not, you don't really know. You have to do the measurement or do the, um, the calculation, and it's much easier to get these values than, than these values. Okay. So the challenge is figuring out what this function is to make this mapping from x to, to y. By the way, a lot of the discussion I will be using the next few slides is from this book by Trevor Hastie called Introduction to Statistical Learning. And so if you want a more of a deep dive into the information, this book is wonderful. It's freely available and it's via PDF online. So you can take, you can take a look. Okay, so uh, how do we make this prediction? Typically you want to compare or estimate using some function f of x to the actual value, right? Um, y, and you want to make this difference between y and y hat small, and it, it break it down into some uh, two parts, a reducible part and an irreducible part. Well, this part here, you can tune the model to best get the um, estimate for f, but there's always a part where, where you don't know, this, which is the uncertainty in your, in your measurement or, or your data. So the goal is to minimize this, and this is called a loss function, by the way. I might use this term um, later down the road. So you want to minimize your loss. Okay. Right, so another way to um, extract information from F is not just for prediction, it's also for inference. And in this case, you want to learn how your X1 through Xn, or X to P in this case, affect Y, or how are they related to each other? Okay, so, and this is linked to learning um, some information, extracting knowledge from the, the function, okay, or, or doing inference. Okay, so there are a few ways to estimate f. One way is to pick some function. This is the so-called parametric method. One example is shown here, where f of x is uh, none other than linear regression here, a linear model b to naught plus b to one, x one plus b to two, x two, and so on. And if you just had b to one and x one and b to naught, you'd have uh, mx plus c. This is just your linear regression. And we're adding more x terms here to make it a, a, a multivariate regression, okay? Typically what we do is we train or tune these uh, coefficients, the betas, on a treating data, and then we can make predictions of test data and, and compare the predictions to the actual test values later on, okay? So the goal is to make some function f of x which approximates the uh, actual behavior for y. Let's take an example. In this case, we're trying to guess the income based on someone's seniority and education. So we have data here, and we plot the seniority and ed education and the salary or income uh, in this plot here, where each point represents a person's income, uh, education, and seniority. And this plane here is a, this two-dimensional line which attempts to fit to the data, okay? And so we're using uh, least squares to fit the data and we're showing the fit as this yellow plane. And we tune beta one and beta two to get the good model to make the, um, the, uh, the prediction for income of new uh, people whose education we know, seniority we know, but income we don't know, for instance. Okay. Um, so there are a couple challenges that arise. Uh, what if your function your behavior isn't linear, right? How do you then go about predicting um, the behavior? And what if you have no idea what the behavior should look like? What if it's not um, something you can guess? What if it's something that you can write down? How do you go about um, predicting the function f of x? Does anyone have any, any idea on what to do? The idea is you, you choose a more flexible model, and there are a few ways you can go about doing that. Um, for a parametric approach, a parametric approach, what's one way you think you can do to make a model more flexible? In this case, you have beta one, beta two, and time beta one times education, beta two times seniority. You have your bias or your uh, your intercept term. What could you do to make this model more flexible? This one here in particular.
select a polynomial model instead of a linear model? No, oh, excellent. That's a great answer. Great. So you can add um, beta three times education squared, right? Or education cubed, and then add a beta four times seniority squared and so on. Excellent. Well, that's a great answer. Okay, so that's what you can do. For instance, if you have a, a model, you try, uh, a data you try to fit, you have some two good ideas of of how the you know the income should vary with that, uh, but you're not quite sure how it's supposed to vary, and you want to make it more flexible to maybe uh, kind of fit the nonlinear parts. And that's a really great great suggestion. Okay, great. So let's um, let's keep going, and and so there, there's another class of models called non-parametric methods, which we haven't talked about yet, and these are more more flexible than the parametric methods. And examples of those include decision trees. You've actually seen decision trees before, a few slides ago. Uh, carry nearest neighbors, which we'll talk about in a little bit, and support vector machines, which we won't talk about, but are also very useful and are, are important for uh, machine learning and data scientists. So this is an interesting plot, a trade-off between accuracy and model interpretability. Fortunately, uh, there is inverse relationship. Of course, you can have um, both things that are good at the same time. That's kind of seems to be a law of nature. So the interpretability is high for the for them to be uh, lower accurate, lower accuracy models, and also lower flexibility models, which is the case for the least uh, squares regression, which you're familiar with. And if you make the model a little bit uh, more flexible, or you start doing things with trees, and you have a little bit less interpretability, unfortunately. Okay, and spurt vector regression is all the way down here. Pretty high flexibility, but very low interpretability. So the idea is you can make a really good prediction, but you can't really tell how the model got there. You, you can't extract useful knowledge from, from the model after it's been trained, which is unfortunate. In some cases, you know, this is actually having best of both worlds is an is a active area of research. Okay. So the idea is, uh, this is in words, what we just talked about in the previous slide, the more restrictive models, I tend to be um, giving you uh, sometimes less accuracy, but uh, less interpretability, or rather more interpretability, and the less more flexible models tend to be uh, higher accuracy, um, but also less interpretable. And so the, the idea is for the linear regression, we can really interpret x1 and x2 and, and their coefficients to mean something very concrete, right? So in this case, uh, if you find that beta one was large and beta two was small, you can say, well, education is really important for income. Um, but you know, there's some finite beta two, and so you can kind of say, well, this fraction of person's income is due to their education. This fraction of seniority based on these coefficients beta one and beta two. So this is this linear regression, as you know, is very interpretable. But something like uh, this this entry, which you saw a few slides before, let me see if I can find it. Here you go is a lot less interpretable. Well, you can still make a discussion, but um, it's less than less than a linear regression. Okay, let's see. All right, so do we have any questions so far? All right, if not, so let me continue. So in data science, typically there, there are two Broad class of problems, supervised learning problems, and unsupervised learning problems. There are actually more, but I'll, I'll only just mention these um, for for now. Um, if you're interested, you can actually look it up in this book by Trevor Hasty, and there are some good lectures online by um, uh, Jan Lacoon on something really exciting called semi-supervised learning. Anyway, so the idea is, let's say you have some data, uh, x1 and x2. Uh, these are descriptors, right? Kind of like income and seniority on the x horizontal and vertical axis, and each point represents something. Um, it could be, uh, let's see, whether it's metallic or insulating, right? So uh, these circles or x's represent something, some label. And then you, you notice that um, different labels, label A, label B, are falling different parts of this descriptor space. So what you can what you can then do. If so well, I notice a pattern. All the X's are on the right side, top right. All the all the circles are on the bottom left. 
So you can use this to build a, a supervised domain model where you know the labels, you can make predictions based on where the labels are. Now, this one here, all of these points here are unlabeled, but what's interesting about these points? Does anyone um, want to make a guess? Um, they're clustered in like different areas. Mm -hmm. So Excellent. like, yeah. Yeah, keep going. Um, so that means you could sort of group based off of where they are on the graph because mm -hmm. they're all sort of in like the same area. Mm -hmm. Excellent, yeah, good. So we can do that, is this what you said? And then what could we do next, do you think? Let's say you're in the lab and you did some measurements or you're, uh, you know, you're on the supercomputer, you run some calculations and you found data that look kind of like this, but they don't have labels, but you know they're related in this way. What's the next thing that you want to do? Um, could you put labels on them to become more clear if there's other data like that in the future? Perfect, 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 exactly. So you, you do that, and then you find that all the all the um, circles in this are, uh, I think this is black, all the all the circles here are red, and all the circles here, I think that's blue yeah, or purple or something, something like that. So then you start finding patterns in the result, and you could learn something um, you know, instead for, for a situation where you had no data in the beginning. This is the unsupervised learning task, okay? And you, you've seen how useful that can be, even though you don't have any labels to begin with, okay? Great. All right, so basically this looks like it's explanation of what we just talked about. So you, in supervised learning, you have, I, I'm just, just going to repeat, you have labels, you have um, descriptors, and um, you can build a model to make with the labels to make the next prediction, All right? And then um, you can uh, basically reduce the loss function to get a really good model given given this given this learning task. Now the unsupervised learning is a bit tougher. You don't have labels, but you can still find clusters in data given the observations and their their descriptors, even though you don't have a response. But it helps still helps you learn something useful. Okay. So there's a regression and classification task, which is probably you're probably familiar with this from from your past. So um, the variables can be quantitative or qualitative. And qualitative are also called categorical variables. Typically in regression, you're predicting something that's quantitative, and in classification, you're predicting something that has a categorical variable or is um, qualitative, a cat or dog, as opposed to 1.01 .01 versus two. Okay, for the quantitative case. Okay, um, yeah, this is what you said. So examples for these quantitative variables include things like person's age, height, or income, and the value of a house, which we talked about a little bit before. And the qualitative variables include things like, you know, the colors, um, gender, uh, and brand of a product, ABC, um, whether the person involved in debt or not. So yes or no. Okay. Any questions about this so far? All right, so now that you have a well-defined learning task, you, you choose whether it's going to be supervised learning or semi-supervised, sorry, unsupervised learning, or it's going to be regression or classification, you can, you, what you want to do is make a good model um, and then parameterize how mo well your model is working. And for that, you need to assess your model accuracy. So we, we a little bit already talked about that. So we, we had this Y, actual data minus the prediction, Right, and this one is is because there's a square here, it's a mean squared error. This is some some way of parameterizing the loss. How well does your model prediction compare with the actual data? And you average all the points. And that's one way to measure the quality of fit. And there's there are other ways to do this, um, but this MSC gives you a really reliable way of um, estimating how well your model fits the data. And as you can imagine, this is useful for Regression or classification or both. We can do a vote. Who says it's good for classification? Say I. Right. Who thinks it's good for, for regression? Say I. Hi. Good. Good. Yeah. Hi. You got you got it. So whoever said that, you're right. Good job. So this kind of um, 
scheme is good only for the regression. Great. So let's, let's take an example of that. So we have some training data over here, these um, blue circles here. And you can fit your model, in this case, mx plus c. You tune this for each point such that your, your, um, your msc is as low as possible. And then you have a model, which is this dashed line. And then in the end, you can compare your model to data it hasn't seen before, the so-called test data. And let's do that here. And in this case, all your, your red squares are pretty close to your model prediction, and so you're pretty happy with the model because not only does it work well in the training data, more importantly, it works well in the test data. So you, your model is generalizable. That's truly really key for the machine learning. If it fits well on the training data, but not test data, you haven't made a good a good model. And you can get a sense of how well your model is fitting by using these, these MSC um, ideas. And for this case, as as you said, or uh, sorry, I didn't catch your name, um, it's only for the, for the regression problems. There are different metrics for the classification problem, which I think we'll talk about maybe next. So for the classification, you use these so-called indicator functions, and this is basically saying um, what thing? What is what does this complicated expression mean? Well, hit. This is called the training error rate. Okay, so I know you're you're um everybody shy today. If this misclassified, then it gets uh, a one. If it's not misclassified, if it's correctly classified, then it goes to zero. Okay, so you're just adding up ones and zeros based on whether the you know you predict a cat um or a dog, depending on whether it's right or not. You you tally up these um predictions. Okay. So it looks complicated, but it's a fairly simple, simple idea. All right. So let's look at an example of how to do classification that's not decision trees. And this one we'll be looking at next is the so-called K nearest neighbors. And maybe it's it's maybe uh, the algorithm is fairly complicated, but in in the the idea is um, actually fairly straightforward. So there you have some points. You have these circles. Sorry, um, these are squares and triangles. And you have a circle here, which is some unknown point. So you need to classify this as either a square or a triangle. Okay, so you, you spent, a, say, a couple hours um, analyzing your data and making the measurement. You found these all to be squares. You have some new point, there's maybe some new material, and you need to measure it to determine whether it's metallic or, or insulating. And um, instead of doing the measurement, you made the plot and you have this on un labeled point right here, and you need to make a determination of whether it's going to be metallic or insulating based on this data analysis. Okay, and so um, you can do k nearest neighbors, and the idea is you can make a k nearest neighbor classification. That is, look at the the k uh, neighbors and make a classification based on that. So what does that mean? So if if for instance k is equal to three, so this has three neighbors one two three. You do majority class, and this this circle here represents the um, neighbors within three um, of this unknown. So if it's, if you're doing um, three nearest neighbor classification and you're doing majority class, what would you do for this particular case? Would you classify it to be a circle, um, rather a square, or a triangle? A triangle. Right, good, 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 good. No, let's do ask something harder then. So if, since you got that one, what if you're making the classification to be a one, two, three, four, five nearest neighbor classification? What would you make the classification be? Is it going to be a square or a triangle in that case? What is the majority of class? Would it be a square? Yeah, good. Yeah, you got it. So actually, that's very clever, even though you're a little bit shy today. Um, that's that's right. That's the right answer. Okay. So what you can do is you can kind of tune then this this radius, the uh, tune k, and um, figure out uh, based on some metrics we will talk about, like based on validation, um, what is a good number for k? And typically, uh, k equals one is is a good is a good guess. But there are some ways you can you can um, basically tune k and check the results to 
ensure that you have the optimal value for, for k. All right. So that's that's how you do cure nearest neighbor classification. This this is the saying that k is usually the best. K equals one is usually the best um, or most intuitive at least um, result. Okay, so let's compare k nearest neighbors, which is kind of a more uh, flexible model, to one that's less flexible but more interpretable. This linear regression. So we have some points. These points are going to be either a green or blue, I think, uh, circles. And if you do linear regression, you make this decision boundary like that. Most of the the yellow green points are in one part, most of the blue points on the other part. Or you can do this, um, and you can see that there are many points that are misclassified, right? By looking carefully. Or you can do this cared nearest neighbor classification, and you find that decision boundary is, is kind of nonlinear, and you get a better result in, in the end. This is for 15 nearest neighbor classification. Okay, any questions so far? All right, so let's keep going a little bit more and then we'll take a break soon. Um, but let's go a little bit a little bit more before taking that break. Okay, so now let's let's transition to more classification using trees on an example that's more physics uh, related. Let's use a ferromagnetic tradition, tradition metal alloys. And I'm plotting a two-dimensional descriptor space, where the first descriptor is atomic volume, and the next descriptor is calculated chemical hardness, and this is goes like compressibility or d mu dn, where mu is the chemical potential, n is the number of electrons. And in this plot, we have only uh, traditional metal alloys, and the the black squares are the non-metal alloys, and the 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 open squares are the um, magnetic alloys, and this part is zoomed in here. And so what can you tell by looking at this plot and using your brains as your pattern recognition model to uh, tell what the key pattern is here? For those of you who haven't had your coffee yet, yep, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, uh, the points that are in the top uh, right will be uh, outside of the ferromagnetic region. Uh, mm -hmm. The ones that are in the bottom left uh, mm -hmm. would be. Mm -hmm. uh, and I guess you can like separate it using a line. Yep. Excellent. Excellent. Great. Great. Yeah. So you can draw the lines, and there's one here, right? Also, and uh, you can actually draw one here. That's like a decision boundary for different descriptors. To tell, you know, if it's in this region of the space, this two dimensional descriptor space, then as you said, it's going to be one or the other, ferromagnetic or non magnetic. Excellent. Okay, so it, let's say you have this new, you know, metal. You don't know what it is because you haven't done the measurements, but it takes you a day to do the measurement. So you, you don't want to do that, right? Because it's, it's a whole day of work. Instead, you want to be lazy and then make a prediction. What would you predict this to be? Let's replace lazy with clever. What, do you, what would you make this prediction to be? And one person knows the answer. We can ask someone else to um, tell us what it is. Is it non-magnetic or, or magnetic? Uh, I guess it will be outside, so it wouldn't be inside the ferromagnetic region. Mm -hmm. Good, great. So you basically answered two questions in one go. So this would be non-magnetic, this would be magnetic. Excellent. And for, for representation of the model based on the decision trees, it's, it's quite a simple one. It looks like this where the hardness is one node, the atomic volume is the other node, and the and these are the lines at, at 0.25 and are going to be magnetic, sorry, non-magnetic, or going to atomic volume, magnetic, or non-magnetic. It's, it's really um, simple, this decision tree model. And this particular model has 100% accuracy, so it's a really great success. And actually, it, it's a little more complicated for that than that for the, Disordered binary alloys, but for the ordered alloys, it's it's really nice. It's really nice model, uh, really clean um, data, and easy to get the simple model to make a good prediction. Okay, all right. So let's see. Let's take a short break, maybe five minutes, and in the five minutes, you could stretch or something, and um, let us set up. 
or exercise in your knee time. So I will copy paste this link. This is going to be an exercise we do do towards the end of the class. And I'll post it to the WebEx. So you have it. There's also a Google Drive link, which I hope works. It works for me, but someone said once it didn't work for them. But it has the same information as a Google, sorry, the GitHub page. That's the GitHub page, which has the same information as a Google Drive link. I'm also sending you in the paper that is referencing the data set that we'll use is also here. And I'll show you how to get the data set in, um, in the time that's closer to when we'll do the exercise. Okay. So I'll give you another two minutes of a break before we get back into the, the discussion. But in the meantime, um, please just copy paste these links to your browser. And let's say you have it ready. And if you don't have a Google Colab and don't, have a Google account, please uh, log in to Google, get an account. And if you don't have your Google Drive set up, please, please set it up in the next two minutes. And if you haven't used Google Colab before, I'll also send you a link. Google Colab is essentially a way to do Python via Jupyter Notebooks that are on the cloud. It's very useful for this kind of setting and also for doing your research if you don't want to install Jupyter Notebook on your, on your laptop. What I'll also do, since we have another minute, I'll go ahead and post a link to the data that we'll use in about uh, half an hour or so. Okay, so the last link posted to the chat is the link to the data set. All right, so on, we have about another minute left, so go stretch, use the bathroom, and come back within a minute, and I'll, we'll, we'll, we'll restart. All right, great. So we'll get started again. Um, it's a short break, but it's a, it's a break at least. All right, so next we'll talk about how to choose the descriptor. That's essentially how do you um, choose a representation that which you'll use to build um, the model to make the prediction. Okay. So one way to do that is to think about um, you know, your knowledge of the data you're looking at. So if you're looking at housing prices, you might ask a real estate agent what they think about um, metrics for good uh, for predicting housing prices. You can also just uh, visualize the data and guess based on how the data are looking um, what the scripture might be and kind of screen based on this. So this is an example for housing prices. We're, we're plotting the constructed area on the horizontal axis and the price on the vertical axis. If you look at the data, you might say, well, there's some sort of linear correlation here. And that might be a good metric. The constructed area might be a good metric for predicting the housing price. Okay, and indeed that's, um, that is certainly the case. It's not uh, perfectly correlated, but um, there, there is certainly a correlation there. So you can imagine going through different metrics like numbers of windows or some, something else like zip code and see if there's also this kind of behavior and using this analysis, determine whether or not this descriptor X sub I is a good descriptor for your model. Okay, okay so um, essentially you wanna have uh, kind of two goals for building a model. One is uh, you want to make a good prediction. Uh, and that prediction should be reliable for data, especially data model hasn't seen or so-called test data. 
And also, you'd like to learn something from the from the model, which is that's usually harder to to get at, um, but also you know, also important. And for ensuring that the model is generalizable, essentially you 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 can play a few games to to have that happen. You can subdivide your data, your existing data set, into smaller portions. And just play games with uh, resampling and dividing into trading and validation sets to um, ensure or push model uh, journalizability. So, what does resampling mean? Um, typically, you just have your data set and you pull points at random and you can replace them as well and pull them again and you use a subset of your data and resampled to make uh, the model fit and to test your model out. Okay, so that's um, uh, the idea behind resampling methods. Typically, you're having a trading set and a validation set for, for doing this. And you trade your model, between the coefficient with the trading set, and you check the scores um, given um, the validation set. There's also uh, validation which is a little bit similar to resampling, but um, in this case, you have a well-defined trading set, validation set, and test set, which is some fraction of all the data you have accessible to you. Typically, you don't touch the test set at all until at the very end, you just compare the prediction to the test set. But when you're given the validation set, you start tuning some parts of your model to make it a bit better. Right? So your validation set can see um, how the model's been changing, and certainly training set is, is used to, to um, tune the model. It's coefficient, I should say. Okay. And typically, this split is like 70, 30, 10, something like that. Sorry, 70, 20, 10, something like that. Okay, so with the sampling methods, you typically can do this um, cross validation, which uses mean squared error. And you can do KFOL cost validation and leave one out cost validation. And the example for, for KFOL loss validation is as follows over here. Uh, let's say for five fold cost validation, take your data set and you divide it into five folds. The first fold you use as your validation fold, and the other four as your training fold. You train a model, you make the prediction, and then you say um, what the score is. Then you swap the fold and make this bit the validation fold and the other bits fitting fold. You train the model on the training data, you predict on the validation data, you get the validation score, and you have the performance. You continue like this until you have five performances and you take the average. And this is a good way to to um make sure that your how you sample the data doesn't affect your model too much. So based on on this average of, of scores, you can get a better idea of how this particular model is performing. Okay, and then you can use this average score, cross validation score, to tune as a metric to tune your model to improve it. Okay, are there any questions about that? Okay, all right. So, so then essentially, you you can go through something called model selection that involves from a set of descriptors that you have, you want to typically take only the best reasonable descriptors, and this is uh, parameterized by or described by subset selection. So you identify which subset of descriptors are going to be useful for your model. This is often important because having too many descriptors is going to lead to um, unreliable models, models that don't generalize well, something called overfitting, which I'll show you more details about in a second. So you, you have methods to shrink your models so they perform better. And so you basically don't have too many descriptors playing a role in your, in your model training. There's another tool called dimensionality reduction, which is another metric to reduce your total number of descriptors to a subset of those uh, that are available. And we'll have an example of that in, in a little bit. So overfitting. So why is overfitting bad? So let's take three plots, same data, different models. Take a look at this plot here um, and the fit. You can tell this isn't a good fit. This one here seems like a really perfect fit. There's something a bit off about the model, right? This is the overfitting case. The model is fitting even to the noise in the data. 
this model here is, is the Goldilocks model. It's, it's just right where the model is nicely fitting the underlying behavior. There is some error there, which is the noise that it doesn't fit to. So this is just the perfect uh, model you want to have. And so each model has a different number of terms. So the idea behind shrinkage, dimensional energy reduction, is reduce these terms to such that the model is just right and doesn't overfit. That is fit to the noise. Okay. So you can take a number of predictors or a number of descriptors and just reduce it and look at the score and see how the score changes and pick the best number of predictors or descriptors based on that metric. There's also something called um, uh, the, the um, uh, ridge regression and lasso. Ridge regression essentially is mean squared error or um, least squares regression plus this term here, which is having the coefficients squared. And having this, this term here forces the other coefficients in the model, the ones here, to be closer to zero. And by doing this, essentially, you, by increasing this lambda term here, you can push the coefficients in the model towards some small value, therefore making them, uh, shrinking them, making them less pronounced, and hopefully reducing overfitting. There's also a lasso, which is something similar. You had it add a term with some regularization parameter, and there's no square here. And it turns out that this has a profound effect on how the model behaves. So the, the, the coefficients go to exactly zero faster than you would have for the ridge regression case. And that has to do with this plot here, where this is the boundary for the betas, the last zone, and the betas are the coefficients for the ridge regression. And these curves here are loss, are loss curves, so different values for beta. And it, this just shows that you can actually get a zero value for a coefficient in this case, because of the shape of this boundary, it's um, model, modulus the, the, the beta. And here, because it's beta squared, um, it's a circle. And so it's harder to get to zero, but you can get close to zero, but only zero at infinity. Okay, so that explains that, that shape. The regularization is very important for getting a model that doesn't overfit. You can also do these dimensionality reduction tools. One example of that is this PCA, or principal component analysis. The idea behind PCA is that you have some data, and here is two-dimensional space, and you can choose the data, the, um, uh, what do you call this, the axis, with the most variant in data along this direction. Perpendicular to that is going to be the second principal component, where the most variance is the first. And in three-dimensional space, something similar happens. You have x1, x2, x3. The first PC component is here. Second here, third here. What you can do is, is then throw the third component and reduce your space to two dimensions or just one, where the first component captures the most variance in the data. Hopefully, capturing the most explainability in how the descriptors are linked to the target property. Okay, this is another example here for a um, uh, reduction case going from two or some scripture space to its scripture space with PC applied to it. And you can imagine here, this second component here is less important for explaining um, the data in this case. All right, so um, why do you wanna reduce the space because if you have too many dimensions, uh, it's hard to fit uh, to a model for a few reasons. And I've already alluded to the fact that they can be overfitting, but there is more profound reading reason to do that. And that's the following. Basically, um, we have a potential to have more descriptors or more predictors than we have data points. And when that happens, there, there's a, a problem. And in the past, or statistical models were built around the assumption that we have many more data points than descriptors, but these days you can go in the reverse. Okay. And so um, when this happens, when the number of data points is on the same amount of number of predictors, then, then um, we have this case where we have a high dimensionality case. And there are a few ways we can, we can, a few things we can do to fight that. We discussed already ridge regression, lasso, PCA, subset selection, making the models that have the potential to overfit, that be too high dimensional, um, a little bit less flexible. And that's, that's a good thing. 
So why is uh, having data in high dimensions wrong? Well, the example here is we have lots of data points, just one dimension, we can make it fit, no problem. But if we have two points and one dimension, then it's hard to say that you can make a reliable model when you just fit the line to two points, right? So this is illustrating why um, high dimensional data is not so good. You could also imagine having 10 points and 10 dimensions, it's gonna be the same same kind of problem, right? You're gonna have a hard time fitting reliable model to 10 points in 10 dimensional space. Okay, so let's go on tree-based methods. And we talked about this already. So basically you have a decision tree, you break it up into different regions. But as we saw in the case of the transition metal alloys, and given and this is for a different data set, so called um, baseball hitters data set. And here is a more sophisticated tree where each region is going to be a, not a, uh, a class, but a number, which you can use predict um, quantitative things with your regression on. Okay. And this is this information shown um, with plateaus with each. Uh, y value represents a, a um, salary for a baseball player, and these x1 and x2 values represent the descriptors in the data set. So I use actually the random forest regression, which is a collection of decision trees to my, to my regression problem for the materials data, which we'll talk about um, pretty soon. So why can regression model for random forest be used to un capture some underlying function? especially is one as complicated as materials probability behavior. Well, let's, let's take an example of using the random forest to predict the behavior of a sine curve plus noise. So this is a sine curve, and these are points that represent that there's some noise. And we want to use the decision tree to predict uh, or fit to a sine curve with noise. So this is a tree with just one um, set of nodes, depth one. This is depth two. You can see the fit is better. Before it was pretty horrible. Step three, it's actually starting to look like a sine curve. So it's it's doing not a bad job. But if you go to too high depth, start doing overfitting and start fitting to the noise, and that's not good. So you, you do these um, cross validation techniques to develop your, your decision tree to fit to the underlying data without fitting to the noise. And even for a sine curve, you can, you can kind of do it pretty well. Okay, so it's it's... It's um, just an illustration for how you can use a decision tree to fit to some complicated function. Okay. Um, typically, you don't just use one tree. You use a collection of trees or a forest, and that essentially works by uh, majority voting. You have some trees on some data set, then you majority vote, and then you take the, kind of the, the, the average or majority vote for the class and the average for the uh, regression problem to say what your output of the random forest is. Okay, so there are a few ways in practice you implement uh, machine learning models. You essentially call Python modules, the packages, to do SciPy, Kara, Scikit-learn, and you don't write the code yourself. So in practice, what you do is you import some modules here, have some data, then you in one line fit your, your linear model the data, and then after that, you can just exploit the model that you fit to do other things. Okay, so uh, in practice, you don't write your own linear regression code, but you borrow someone else's. And typically, uh, for a scikit learn, you can use a linear model and implement lasso, which regression needed random forests using um, these, these tools. Okay, so lastly, I'll, and quickly, I'll talk about the magnetic materials data we're working with. In a little bit. These are based on these chromium gradient telluride materials. These crystal structures look like this. Interestingly, if you take chromium gradient telluride, as you, you've seen before, it's going to be ferromagnetic. But if you replace germanium with silicon, what you find is that it becomes anti ferromagnetic. And this is curious because you replace one non magnetic atom, atom with another one. And therefore, uh, you can tune the chemical composition change the magnetic properties, which I thought was interesting. So the question is, how much can you tune the chemical composition to affect the magnetic properties? You can make many more chemical substitutions at the A 
B or the X sites, where the A is site is chromium, the B site is germanium, and the X site is tellurium. Okay, and if you do this kind of uh, as much as possible with all the trace metals, different combinations for the silicon, germanium, phosphorus, the B site, and all the collagens and the X site, you get about ten to the four combinations. So it's quite a few. Um, I choose I chose a subset of two hundred to do DFT calculations on, and extracting different uh, magnetic uh, properties and th information energy properties such as the or thermal thermodynamic properties such as formation energy, which is a proxy for the chemical stability. If you do that, um, you can then collect your data. And I'll, I'll show you that in a bit. Um, this is a little bit more details on how the atoms were chose chosen. The chemical substitutions. Um, A sites were chosen like this, B sites like this, and all X sites were basically replaced with sulfur, selenium, or tellurium. This is a, visually how the substitutions are made the A sites, B sites, and the X sites. Okay, so then you can do the calculations. It takes you about half a year on a supercomputer. Then you can present the results. This is for the magnetic moment. The A site substitutions here, B sites here, and the X sites for different panels. You notice that uh, this is for the magnetic moment or the magnetization of the materials. There's a clear pattern that's showing showing up here. It's hard for a brain to understand or quantify the pattern, but it, it's there. And the hope is for machine learning models to learn what the pattern is and make quantitative predictions based on the results. Now, formation energy is also important. Formation energy, again, is a proxy for chemical stability. We can make again the DFT calculations again take about half half a year on a supercomputer. Uh, for only two hundred samples, we can plot the formation energy. You now each color represents the formation energy on the um, these plots with the A site substitutions, B sites, and the X sites as the panels. Now for here, the more the darker color represents more chemically stable, the lighter color represents less chemically stable. And there is again uh, some clear pattern which we can try to exploit with machine learning models. So the descriptors for this case are just descriptors comprising atomic properties, such as the unpaired electrons, the uh, number of spin-up electrons, atomic radius, and so on. And we stitch them together by taking the mean properties of A, B, and C, or A, B, and X, and the variance of A, B, and X, and so on. And we get about 61 descriptors in total if we, if we do that. With these descriptors, very simple descriptors, we can then build a model using the random forest. Then once you build the model, you have these results. So in this case, we've plotted DFT calculated magnetic moment on the horizontal axis and the prediction on the vertical axis. And the dashed line is not a fit, it's just a guide to the eye. It's the so-called perfect prediction line. And my trading data, the um, circles, are pretty close to this perfect prediction line. And so are my test data, or so-called unseen data. This suggests that the model is doing a pretty good job. For predicting the minute moment, so as we're very really happy, and these predictions were done very quickly once the model was was trained. So I'll, I'll skip this part in just of time. Uh, so and I'm also interested in predicting the formation energy. So I did that with random forests, and this fit is is pretty good. And also with other models like kernel regression and even a neural network model, and because all these points are fall, falling close to this perfect prediction line. My model is, is doing a pretty good job. So what I can do is, if, if my remaining um, 10,000 or so candidates, I don't want to actually do quantum simulations on, because it'll take me many, many years, I can then do machine learning predictions and find the results in milliseconds on my, on my laptop here, which is now getting pretty old. And I'm showing here a subset of the results for the minute moment and the formation energy. So once you have all these predictions, you can then do some screening uh, you can say, well, I want uh, materials that have a uh, high chemical stability and uh, high magnetic moment, and then select the best candidates from DFT and from the predictions. Of course, check the predictions with further DFT results, and then eventually compare these results with experiments and see if the predictions are actually making good sense. And I'll actually skip the experimental discussion in just a time, and let's say, please visit my late, most recent paper for some more information. This is a QR code. If you're interested in, in just uh, holding your camera up to it, it'll take you to the link. And uh, more resources here. This textbook I already told you about. 
There are many resources here, such as the Coursera course for learning about machine learning. If you want to have a resource, please visit my group website, materials-intelligence.com. And uh, my Twitter handle is Quantum Canvas, if you're also interested in you know, adding me to Twitter. And there's this paper here, which we'll use for a data set, which we'll tackle in just a few minutes. Okay. Uh, the link to this paper is also in your, in your chat, in the chat box. That brings us to today's exercise, which we'll have about 50 minutes to do. So we'll create a data set of these ABX structures. I've done that for you. And I included the data on the website, which you can download as a CSV file. Now, I want you to do what, the, what I'd like you to do is use those data to build a model for the formation energy of the materials. And you'll divide your data into a trading set, validation set, and test set. I've provided the descriptors for you, but your task is to pick reasonable ones and use uh, them in your, in your model. And I'd like you to do linear regression and random forest regression. And, and in the end, I'd like you to tune your hybrid parameters, uh, and uh, which is an example of which is the regularization parameter we talked about earlier today. Okay. So the data set is here. Uh, there's a link in the chat with this, uh, with this string here of, of um, digits, characters. And you download the data. You put the data in the CSV file on your Google Cloud Drive or your Google Drive. So you can access it with your Google Colab notebook. And if you don't know how to use Google Colab, just please ask me. I'll, I'll help. I'll walk you through it. Um, but I'll let you uh, figure it out unless you have questions, which you can, which you can ask. In the paper, you'll find that the best descriptors are, are these for information energy. So I'll encourage you to try one of them or none of them and play with it and see if you can get an even better this descriptor than the ones I've used I've used here. Okay, and the Google Colab exercise is posted uh, to the chat, so please open it up, and um, we'll walk you through it a little bit. If you haven't accessed Google Colab before, there's a few steps to do it. You need your Google Colab, uh, Google Drive active. You need to set up your Google Colab and install it to your Google space, and then um, open and run. The notebook that I have online, which you can do by using file open GitHub page and just using the link that I sent to you. Okay. Does anyone have questions about this? So hopefully you'll get to essentially the page that I will show you here. Everyone hopefully should be here on now or sometime soon. So in the remaining few minutes, uh, 10 minutes or so, I'd like you to just walk through this by yourself and ask questions. If you, if you have questions, I'll be here for you rather than my talking. And uh, I think the toughest part is going to be getting the data to your Google Drive. Hopefully you've already done that or close to doing that. And then if you have no idea what, for instance, PD is or PANDAS is, then just ask. Um, but basically the first bit is getting data into the notebook. Then you look at the data a, a little bit. And here is uh, plotting the data frame. And then you will assign targets. Our targets can be formation energy. We'll choose which descriptors you want to use. We'll create your X and Y data. We'll do some visualizations. Then you build a model after a while, in your regression, you make a fit. Then you train your model to random forest to make another fit and play with what you use to fit to the model and so on. Okay, so I won't, I won't explain everything to you because we have a, a little short time. Instead, I'll invite you to walk through the notebook by yourself, starting from now, and just ask questions as they come up. So please go ahead and get started. We still have some time left before we end for the day. By the way, if somebody hasn't gone to this point where having a notebook open, please let me know so I can help you to get there. 